Welcome to our second episode of Tell Me Another, a podcast dedicated to telling good stories from history. Stories of genius and folly, compassion and cruelty. Instead of sitting around a campfire telling stories of our ancestors, we're coming to you from the History Department of the U.S. Naval Academy, located in Annapolis, Maryland. We are coming with stories to tell, and we hope you listen. For our second episode, we have with us in the studio Associate Professor Thomas Burgess, Lieutenant Commander Andy Cox, and Associate Professor Matthew Janique. Today we're continuing with the life of the American adventurer, Walter Murray Gibson. In our previous episode, we heard how in the 1850s, Gibson set out on a quest for power, glory, and adventure. That took him to Mexico, Brazil, and a dungeon in the Dutch East Indies. Escaping from prison, he returned penniless to the States, published a memoir, hit the lecture circuit, and tried to convince the U.S. government to go to war against the Dutch. Failing that, he conceived a plan to transport all the Mormons of Utah to Papua New Guinea. He would personally lead the exodus, though he was not a Mormon and never been to New Guinea. In this episode, we'll see Gibson continuing his quest for power in the tropics. And this time, he'll achieve success, though not in any sort of conventional sense. So in 1859, Gibson traveled to Utah to convince Brigham Young to take his people and leave America altogether. But to his dismay, the answer was no. The Mormons would not exchange their red canyons and sagebrush for lush and tranquil islands on the other side of the world. Gibson was disappointed, but not defeated. He gave public lectures and painted vivid pictures of the exotic and untapped delights of the East. After he and his daughter Tallulah were baptized into the Mormon faith, Gibson then addressed church assemblies alongside the leading figures of the community. Due to popular demand, they moved his lectures to the Salt Lake Tabernacle, Utah's largest public venue. The leading newspaper of the territory commented that, had Brigham Young given the word, many of Gibson's audience would have been ready to forsake their irrigation fields and adobe dwellings to march for the orange groves, the rice and spice fields where the richest odors known to the sense of mortals and gods were wafted on every breeze. Unquote. Brigham Young thanked Gibson for, quote, detailing the different grades of people of which we know but little and in discoursing upon their character and habits. Unquote. But he may have also worried that Gibson was lighting a fire in his people's imagination that would be hard to put out. Because soon after his baptism, he sent Gibson as a missionary to New York City. By the time Gibson arrived in the city, he was destitute and forced to rely on the generosity of local Mormons. It was there that Gibson appears to have made a fateful decision. Rather than devote himself to unpaid church service or trying to scratch out a living in Utah, Gibson concocted a scheme that would take him far away to the islands of the sea. He rushed back to Utah and offered no apologies for abandoning his mission. Instead, he declared to packed audiences that back east, a Japanese delegation had invited him to serve as a missionary in their fabled island territory. Brigham Young was pleased. He invited Gibson to dine with him and share his podium. Gibson wowed audiences when he spoke of his acquaintance with the King of Siam, and of his burning desire, quote, to go forth with a message of life and salvation to the dark and benighted people of the Eastern Hemisphere. Within weeks, Gibson set off with his daughter Tallulah on a new mission to the islands of the Pacific. When they arrived in Hawaii in in July 1861, they they found that thousands of native islanders had converted to the faith, yet their ranks had been dramatically reduced by smallpox and apostasy, and had not seen any missionaries in several years. Nevertheless, the Hawaiians were trying to pool their funds and purchase land on the island of Lanai where they could build their own settlement and live together in a Zion-like community. A Hawaiian chief had converted to the faith and offered 10,000 acres at 25 cents an acre. When Gibson landed on Lanai and then rode on horseback up to the rim of an extinct volcano, and saw the round valley of Palawai below, he was moved to tears. His moment of destiny had come. He would make this volcanic crater the nucleus of his kingdom. 
A few weeks later, Gibson strode into a Mormon church conference on the island of Maui and in front of a crowd of about a thousand presented his official letters signed by Brigham Young and festooned with ribbons. The Hawaiians accepted him as their spiritual guide. According to Bailey, they thought of Gibson as handsome, kind, reverent, high in the priesthood and crowned with knowledge and infinite wisdom. Gibson declared, my heart is with the red skinned children of Abraham. I am a child of the ocean and of God. Like Moses, shall I lead you? Like Joshua, I shall fight for you. And like Jesus, if God wills it, I will die for you. Gibson collected the funds necessary to buy lands on Lanai and had them signed over to him personally. The funds came from poor Hawaiians who sold whatever they had, sheep, goats, houses, and lands, to meet his demands. After only a couple months, Gibson confided in his diary that the hundreds of Hawaiians laboring to build him a town were, quote, material for a very little kingdom. They should not affect the course of trade nor change much of the earth's balance of power and surely will seem but small material for me after all the hope and grasp of my heart. And yet, with a people so loving and obedient, I would make a port and a commerce, a state of civilization. Gibson felt he was creating an earthly paradise. In a moment of rapture, he wrote, Blessed art thou, Lanai, among the isles of the sea. Thou art my refuge and my sweet home. Thy grassy slopes are a sweet prospect. Thy balmy air fills my frame with a pleasurable wellness. I am sure I hear the voice of God in these hills, and it would be fitting for his footsteps in the valley. I am born again. I am sure that I look with virgin eyes upon a new world and a new life full of purpose. The colony was situated in a crater about three miles in diameter, which lacked fresh water and which was good mostly for grazing. And yet the work proceeded, and gradually a settlement emerged, complete with a chapel, school, and clinic. They planted corn and sugarcane and herded sheep. As high priest and undisputed chief, Gibson adorned himself and his daughter in flowing white robes. He set up sacred shrines and dedicated land for the construction of a temple. He sold priesthood ranks and offices, charging a hundred dollars to be ordained an apostle. And with such fees, he bought half the island of Lanai for himself and his descendants. So Gibson finally got his island kingdom in the Pacific. We've been following this young man with big dreams, sometimes that seem to change easily, rushing back and forth across the U.S., but it always seems to come back to him to this fascination with the same region. I think his experiences in Java became this fixation that drove him to carve out a place for himself and leave and live the, the good life. Uh, and I suspect his professed empathy and concern for the native peoples living there was more of a cover for society and for his own conscience. I mean, he's not really been subtle about elevating himself over the people he finds around him, whether that's in Europe or the South Pacific or America. He loves the place. He loves the idea of the South Pacific. And it doesn't seem to me that it's ever been about any mission beyond just getting back there for himself. If he could have gotten all of this through business or a military career instead of being a prophet, would he, would he have gone that route? I wonder if so. I mean, he certainly clothes himself in authority when he gets the chance. Yeah, Andy, I think he definitely felt a connection with the island of Lanai. You know, the landscape, the remoteness, the natural beauty. Um, and he would say it was a spiritual connection. Um, a feeling that only in a place like this could he fully achieve his destiny. He was a real believer in, in destiny. Um, so even though we think of America in the 19th century as relatively unsettled, a frontier society, um, there were still limits and obstacles to the pursuit of his ambition. I think that's how he saw American society, even then. I think he felt his freest in the Pacific. I really like that, Andy, that Gibson here wants to create or recreate this illusion that he has in his head. And I think that's absolutely key to understanding him at this moment. 
And I, the reason I think that is because he remains deeply exploitative. In fact, possibly even more exploitative now that he's dealing with indigenous Hawaiians than he was even dealing with Americans or Mormons. And I do start to wonder, why did people follow him? Why did they give him such authority? Or why were they willing to accept him as a prophet? Um, it seems surprising that there's not more resistance to Gibson's takeover. Yeah, I think in general, um, Hawaiians embraced Christianity in this time period in large numbers. So the Mormons weren't the only proselyting group. There were the Protestant denominations as well, and later the Catholics. And you have to understand what a trauma was imposed on their society by these diseases that were introduced um, by Westerners. And that experience with death and suffering felt that they, maybe their own gods had died or something like that. They were ready for something new, perhaps, or they, they felt that salvation maybe could, could be found someplace else. That's what people have often said about why the Hawaiians in general seem to have turned towards Christianity in the 19th century. But you asked about any kind of resistance to Gibson, and, and we have no record really of, of any such overt resistance or, or confrontation between him and his followers. But there was a passive resistance on the part of Hawaiian Mormons who didn't go to Lanai and submit to his authority, and that resistance was probably fairly common. We only hear about those who went to Lanai and submitted to him. How much do you think Gibson actually believes or buys into the idea of being a prophet? How much of this is performative, do you think, and how much is, is this the real deal for him? Yeah, I really think he believed he was a prophet, or at least entitled to all the powers of heaven, we can say. He felt that uh, he had as much entitlement to revelation or prophecy as Moses or Joseph Smith, the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Mormons, as we know, believed in modern-day revelation, and Gibson was part of that world. He felt that the, the heavens were open and that there was no reason why he should impose any boundaries on himself in terms of, in terms of accessing the powers of heaven. That said, I think he also felt there's that saying, by their fruits, ye shall know them. And he felt that um, even if he didn't actually talk with God, as prophets are supposed to do, he could still claim to be a prophet because he felt that he was engaged in a good cause and that he would produce good fruits and that this would be sort of the evidence of his prophetic calling by producing good deeds and building up this community in Hawaii along on a sound basis. And we're back now with the second part of Gibson's life. Thomas, do you want to take it away? So Gibson exulted in his diary, My island has plenty of peace and love and obedience. I will fill it with family altars, with the songs of women and the prattle of children. I will fill it with love, the love of man to man. One thing Lanai had going for it was that it was uncorrupted by the world. He wrote, there is no vice and, ri and riots of cities here. There is no pride and noisy pomp of courts, no cliques, no coteries, no mutual admiration society, no fashions, no newspapers. And, Lan and Lanai was only the beginning. Gibson declared, this is the nucleus development. Lines of power, of influence shall radiate from this shining crater. I set up my standard here and it goes hence to the islands of the sea. Lanai shall be famous in Malaysia. It shall give birth to a better hope for humanity in Polynesia. What did he mean by a better humanity? He described his sermons this way. I say to them, you are called an enlightened or at least civilized people. But it is not true. You are a poor, miserable, scabby race. 
and so I lash every spark of vanity out of them. But I also say to them, I like to work with you and for you. Your race of men is capable of good and great things. Gibson believed that what Hawaiians needed to protect them from the deadly diseases that were ravaging their population was hard work and hygiene. Gibson reported to Utah that he preached the gospel of plow and hoe, scissors and soap. All was not well, however. Several Hawaiian Mormons secretly sent a letter to Salt Lake in which they asked if Gibson had the right to invent new doctrine, create rituals, and sell offices. Brigham Young was furious and dispatched a team of two apostles and three former missionaries to investigate. They arrived in Lanai in April 1864 and heard a series of accusations against Gibson that he forced them to look upon him as an exalted being and to approach him on their hands and knees as if he were a Hawaiian king. They organized the young men into a militia and trained them for war and promised that a ship would come and they would sail away and capture one island after another. And in this way, they would build a Mormon empire in the Pacific. When the men from Utah asked Gibson to sign over his six 6,000 acres to the church, he refused. He said all of the valley and the people in it were his. He was their shepherd. Dressed in flowing white robes, he said to the Hawaiians that he was their father and that these men from Utah in dark suits were nothing but strangers. When the Hawaiians refused to censure Gibson, the men from Utah put on their hats and departed Lanai but not before telling Gibson, you, sir, will die in the gutter. Days later, at a church conference in Maui, they excommunicated him and saying he sold offices and was trying to build his own empire in the Pacific. He was introducing pagan superstitions and reviving hula dancing even. They called upon all Mormons to gather instead on the north shore of the island of Oahu. There, eventually, they would go on to build a thriving community, college, and temple. With the loss of all of his followers, save a few families, Lanai was a lonely place for Gibson and his daughter. No longer high priest and priestess, they put away their flowing robes. Fortunately, they were joined by Gibson's sons, John and Henry, who helped convert Lanai into a prosperous ranch. By 1867, they had 18,000 goats and 10,000 sheep, Gibson leased or owned nine-tenths of the island of Lanai. Yet he was now in his fifties and restless. Life was solitary and meaningless. As he said to a newspaper reporter, he had set out to found a new religion, one based on cooperation and a cross between his philosophy and superstition. When he contemplated his future, he saw it in the service of the Hawaiian people, but just as in the past, the kind of service that would stir up anger and betrayal, he wrote in his diary that in the days ahead, there will be treasons. I shall perhaps die in the isles by the deed of an island foe, but I shall love them to the end. And it shall be said of me, he was a worker of good among his fellow men, and above all, a lover of the weak island races that had no friend. What's really interesting here is that obviously Gibson is really trying to invent himself as this exalted prophet within the community. But he's also engaging in just typical old-fashioned imperialism. He's saying to the Hawaiians that they need to be saved and he's the person to do it. He's telling them that they're a poor, miserable, scabby race in order to reduce their supposed vanity. This, I think, could be replicated in the voices of a thousand imperialists across the 19th century. Even the idea that he would ultimately be betrayed by the people that he's trying to save is this kind of imperial narrative and an imperial conceit. In this sense, this story is really fascinating because while he is unique, he's also perfectly in line with so many of the kind of supposedly civilizing missions of, of European and American imperialists in the 19th century. Yeah, I, re I agree with the comments about imperialism, even though we're not quite to the, 
to the end of the 19th, to the acceleration of it. Come, uh, but it, it is definitely happening in this age. There's also a lot of the, the white savior characteristic about Gibson himself and his actions and his public words, even what he writes down in his journal. Um, his intentions for a Polynesian empire for their own betterment, as he would put it, of course. And his conduct with the native Hawaiians suggests a lot of ego, but also the same sort of drive you were talking about, Matt, where... This is the echo of almost every other 19th century imperialist we could probably think of. Um, his sermons also run along the, a lot of similar lines that we've seen in other imperialists and missionaries from these Western powers in India, in parts of Africa and Southeast Asia and others. And again, it's his mouth and his ambition that both get him to this prominent place and then run him right into trouble. Now with the Mormons and his own flock of believers. And the Mormons managed to pull away most of the Hawaiian converts, it seems, from Gibson back to Oahu. But, of course, this is also to a settlement on their terms, the Mormons. And yet Gibson still manages to claim this large piece of one island. What's he going to do with this? And what kind of relationship does he maintain with the Hawaiians now? I'm going to be interested to find out. Yeah, in many ways, the most important and interesting part of the story is still to come in the next episode. In our next episode, we'll see what happens when Gibson moves to Honolulu and presents himself as a savior to the Hawaiian people. We'll see how he rises to the very pinnacle of power and once again puts into motion his irrepressible dream of a Pacific Island Empire. This has been a production of the History Department at the U.S. Naval Academy, located in Annapolis, Maryland. If you enjoy our programs, please let us know as we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at USNA History, and our email is historyproductions-group at usna.edu. For more information about the History Department at the Naval Academy, please visit usna.edu history.